Thank you very much. Uh, pleased to be here to talk about uh, some of the challenges we encounter when we get to trying to implement private here. Uh, closer? Yeah. Uh, so some of the previous speakers have already uh, brought up some of the points that I'm going to tie together in a more unified way to indicate the challenges that we face in trying to implement more highly automated vehicles. And in particular, uh, what I'm going to explain is this is probably going to take a whole lot longer than you would have expected based on information that you'd be reading in media or picking up on the internet. I often tell people probably something like 98% of what you've read about the subject is wrong in one way or another. So I'm going to begin with a historical overview of what's been done in this field of road vehicle automation in the past, and then talk about some of the terminology, because it turns out terminology has become a real problem that gets in the way of understanding. And then I will tie together the connected and automated parts of this and show why we really need that connectivity in order for the automation to work, to work well. And uh, then I'll deal with two different aspects of the primary challenges that make this so difficult. Perception technology and safety assurance. And finally, when we put that all together, what does that imply for when we might see some of these services become available and how quickly the market is likely to grow for those services? And so, now we see an that sorry, that's a little bit faint. <laughs> Automatic radio, automatic radio control, maintaining safe distance between the vehicles. Uh, this, this 1939, this was the General Motors Futurama exhibit, in fact, not too many miles away from here at Flushing Meadow, the World's Fair that was held in 1939. So already in 1939, we had a vision of being able to have vehicles driven automatically, uh, long before the DARPA challenges, long before Google. Uh, this is now from the mid-1950s. <coughs> See if we can get the volume up. Synchronize your speed and direction. Notice the analogy to air traffic here, the air traffic controller. She was even called autopilot long before Elon Musk. <laughs> That's a gas turbine powered vehicle. That's why it makes that sound. <laughs> well done, driver two. You're now under automatic control. Hands off steering. You're under automatic control. And notice they fold back the steering wheel. Uh, just like some of the images that we see today, what people are looking forward to. But notice there's nobody else on the road. Uh, <laughs> that makes it a little bit easier than it might be otherwise. Uh, this is from a test track experiment, uh, I believe this was about 1960, but General The driver Motors. still operates accelerator and brakes, but look, no hands. This leaves the driver more relaxed to enjoy the trip. And the cigarette. The more more attention to other drivers <coughs> on the car pick up low frequency radio signals from the varying cable and transmit steering directions to the car. Watch now as this car, traveling out of its lane and under manual control, is switched to auto guide. Notice the control panel there. Uh, 1960, nothing digital whatsoever, entirely analog, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were vacuum tubes in the trunk. <laughs> analog computer that was running this. Plazas of urban living rise over freeways. Vehicles electronically paced, travel routes remarkably safe. Vehicles electronically paced. So. Towering terminals serve sections of the city. Make public transportation more convenient. Provide ample space for private cars. So, so this was a vision of the 25 years in the future, just as the 1939 Futurama was a vision 25 years in the future. So this should have been the case by about 1990. And, uh, by the way, since we're in New York, did anybody else actually attend the Futurama at the 64 World's Fair? Yes. Okay, great. We've got several other people who actually saw it. I, I went there multiple times uh, during uh, my younger years. So, 
Um, this experimental car. This is at Ohio State. And designed to be driverless. She's driverless, 1977. Ohio State University has been working on the project for 10 years. Already working for 10 years. This one may be on the nation's road by the year 2000. Maybe on the nation's road by the year 2000. So there's a pattern here where this is something that's 25 years or so in the future. Here's what we're doing to try to get there, but we're not quite there yet. And I'll include one here from our own work at PATH. This was 1997. We did the automated highway demonstration in San Diego. These were eight vehicles driving with under complete automatic control. There's a safety driver in each one to take over when anything goes wrong. Uh, we took close to a thousand visitors for demonstration rides on these vehicles. Uh, they did lane changing, they changed position automatically. Uh, when they're coming up the hill, like in this scene, you have the sensation inside the car that you have a mechanical link to the car in front of you. You feel what it felt like it was pulling you up the hill uh, because the coupling between them was very tight. So these, uh, but notice nobody else on the road. It's only these vehicles. They don't have to share that space with other road users. So again, that's a way to make it a little bit simpler as a technical problem. The point of this is there's been all generations and generations of technology development work in this field. And when I started as a student in the early 70s, if uh, somebody had told me that 45 years later we'd still be talking about this in the future tense, I think I would have switched fields and tried to work on something else. Um, so I'd like to switch from the history to, to get into a little bit of the terminology, and we do have terminology problems in this field. We often have things described in terms that are either misleading or downright wrong. Um, and I've listed some of the bad words there, driverless. Uh, almost always things get labeled as driverless when they're not, because there's a driver there, but the role of the driver has changed from what it is otherwise. Self-driving is one of these fuzzy terms that Google invented a number of years ago. Robotic is another one of those words that doesn't really mean anything, can mean anything you want it to. And autonomous is probably one of the most troublesome because it has four different usages. And they're all different from each other, but only one of them corresponds to what's in the dictionary. And that is independent and self-sufficient. Has nothing to do with whether there's a human doing things or a machine doing things. If we want to try to characterize the different driving automation systems and understand how they differ from each other, there are really three dimensions that we have to think about. The first is the role of the driver and the role of the system. The second is the degree of connectedness and cooperation. To what extent do those vehicles communicate and cooperate with each other and with the roadway infrastructure? And the third is the operational design domain, which I'll explain on, on the next slides. But to deal with the roles of the driver and the system, we have the SAE J3016 classification. I know Alan doesn't like it, but virtually the rest of the world has adopted it throughout the vehicle industry, and most governments around the world are now referring to this when they're trying to develop rules and regulations, so we're actually talking about the same thing. The things on the left side of the chart from level zero from two are already commercially available. You can go into a dealer and buy a vehicle with those capabilities. But in all of those cases, you, the driver, are still in charge. You are still driving, but these systems are providing support. When we get to levels three and above, however, those are automated driving features. In that case, the system is doing the driving, and you, as the driver, are not. And then there are more specific conditions associated with that. But this boundary between what's the system doing and what's the person doing is really important to deal with. Uh, the operational design domain is the one that often gets overlooked, but this is every bit as important as the other two. Any of these systems will be designed to operate under specific conditions, and it's important to be very precise about what those conditions are. They may be the type of roadway, the type of traffic conditions, what speed range, what density of traffic. Uh, it may be geographic location, for example, within a geofenced boundary where the developer of the system has developed a very detailed map to characterize all of that infrastructure. Of course, there are variations in weather and lighting conditions. Are there cooperative infrastructure elements? Those might be communication systems, they might be pavement markings or signage that satisfy certain standards. They might be different kinds of physical segregations from other road users. All of those affect the technical feasibility of doing the automation. And every system is going to be different from any other system. 
There was some discussion this morning about some pre-specification of the operational design domain in a general way. That is not possible. The manufacturer of the system will have to decide what the operational design domain is for that system based on the limitations of its sensors and the software that it's equipped with. But then that operational design domain restriction needs to be communicated to the users so they know where it can be used. And the system needs to have built-in protections to make sure that the automation cannot be engaged when the operational design domain conditions are not met. Because if somebody tries to use the system outside the operational design domain, they're going to get in big trouble. So there are different kinds of systems that could be identified at each of these levels. And uh, shown like, for example, adaptive cruise control would be a level one system because it only takes on one of the driving functions. But if you have the combination of that with lane centering, uh, a variety of systems listed there, including the Tesla system, that sometimes get mischaracterized as higher. It's basically a level two system, nothing more than that. Level three is a system that's not yet commercially available on any vehicles. Uh, a number of vehicle manufacturers have been working very hard on trying to develop level three systems, but they don't have it at the point yet that it's ready to bring to market. Level four has a very wide range of different systems involved. Uh, some of the low speed shuttles that are intended to drive without a driver would be characterized as level four. Um, there's work on automated valet parking systems, so you might get out of the car at the entrance to the parking garage, and then the car will park itself within a uh, suitably equipped parking garage without human intervention. Um, or there might be a highway driving system that could uh, operate at level four within certain limited access highway conditions. The human would still need to drive the trip ends uh, to and from that highway. We only get to level five when we have a system that can drive under the full range of conditions in which people are capable of driving. All weather conditions, all traffic conditions. That is a dream, that's not a reality. And uh, I know there's sometimes we get people in the industry claiming they're doing level five. That means they don't understand what level five really means. Because at this stage, nobody even knows what sensor technology would have to be put on the vehicle to enable it to do the driving under the full range of conditions in which humans are capable of driving. So let's transition into talking about connectivity because we've got connected and automated vehicle systems. Cooperation through that connectivity augments the data that you can get from the sensors on board the vehicle. The autonomous vehicles, that is the ones that are not connected and are not cooperating, can't communicate with each other. So that means they can't talk to each other. We've done experiments, we can show that if you have automation without connectivity, it's going to be really bad for traffic flow, for traffic efficiency, and probably for safety as well. But if we can make the vehicles cooperative, we enable them to talk and listen to each other as well as seeing, then we can start seeing some of the transportation benefits. Those vehicles can communicate with each other about their performance, about the condition, if they've had faults, for example, on board the vehicle, rather than things that can be sensed directly. So for example, if you've got multiple vehicles driving along the highway, a vehicle five vehicles ahead of you does an emergency braking maneuver. That information can be communicated to all the other vehicles far more quickly and far more accurately than anybody could detect it using the sensors mounted on those other vehicles. So you get the information faster, you get more accurate information. And um, you can also do it beyond sensor line of sight. Uh, say for example, you're in a hilly road and a vehicle has failed and stopped just on the far side of the crest of the hill. There is no sensor that, on your vehicle that's gonna see that. But if you've got the communication system, that information can be communicated to the approaching vehicles so that they know they're going to have to avoid that obstacle that's just beyond the crest of the hill. <coughs> vehicles can negotiate cooperative maneuvers to get better traffic flow. Um, this also makes it possible to get closer separations between vehicles while maintaining safety. So all of those things expand the performance envelope for the automation systems when the vehicles are able to communicate with each other. Uh, we've done a lot of work recently on traffic simulations to try to estimate what the impacts are going to be if we had these automated vehicles with and without connectivity. 
Um, and it turns out this is not so easy to do. Uh, we thought we were going to get into simulating automated systems very quickly. We had to spend a couple of years first developing higher fidelity models of human drivers because we're looking at how we would combine human driven vehicles and automation driven vehicles. So we had to get high fidelity models of the human driver car following and lane changing, which we calibrate with traffic data from a real freeway corridor. And then we model car following behavior of a production adaptive cruise control system and a cooperative adaptive cruise control system based on full scale experimental data. And I'll show you a little bit of that. Then we also model the traffic management strategies that you would use to try to take advantage of the capabilities of the connected and automated vehicles. When we've done the traffic simulations, we get speed profiles out as outputs, which we can use as inputs to a model to estimate what the fuel consumption is going to be. So these uh, analyses are all done on a level one automation system, that is adaptive cruise control and cooperative ACC. But they're relevant to the higher levels of automation as well, because we're going to have the same types of vehicle following behaviors when we go to the higher levels of automation. So let me begin with the production adaptive cruise control system. Um, we did an experiment. We had four vehicles equipped with production adaptive cruise control system, very high-end vehicles with good performance. We programmed the first vehicle to do a series of accelerate, cruise, decelerate maneuvers, and then just let the adaptive cruise control systems on the followers do the car following. So we have the speed profiles on the left, the accelerations on the right. The upper plot in each case is the test data measured on the vehicles. The lower plot represents the predictions of the model that we calibrated based on the test data. So what we see here is a very serious spring instability. So for the traffic guys, this is much worse than what you would have if we had humans doing the driving. But this is what you get with cruise control. And indeed, out here, the front vehicle was braking at one meter per second squared. The fourth vehicle was braking at almost three meters per second squared. We amplified the disturbance by a factor of three. And the delay between the braking of the front vehicle and the braking of the fourth vehicle was over five seconds. Now, that's just a disaster for traffic flow. Uh, this is worse than humans because the sensors on the adaptive cruise control can only see the motion of the vehicle immediately in front of them. They know nothing about the vehicles further in front. And if you were driving one of those vehicles and you saw brake lights, three or four vehicles up ahead, you're going to at least back off on the gas and you're going to know you're going to have to slow down pretty soon. The system doesn't know that. So what we've got is a traffic instability here. We took the same vehicles, we added the vehicle to vehicle communication, and we changed the, con the car following controller so that it could make use of that information, and now we smoothed everything out. And now you see all of the vehicles following the same speed profile and the same acceleration profile. This now is very good for car following. This also makes it safe to run those vehicles closer together than they would be otherwise. So this is one of the reasons why we really want to have the cooperation. So we took the models, and we get the models in the lower chart here, a uh, lower plot on each side, and we put those into traffic simulation, then mix them now in different percentages with manually driven vehicles to see what does it do for our traffic throughput. So this is a case where we, um, let's begin with the green plot. The upper one here is just a pipeline, four lane highway section. We tried to put as much traffic through that as we could. When we're all manually driven with no uh, cooperative ACC, we're around 1,900, 2,000 vehicles per lane per hour. As we add more and more cooperative ACC vehicles, though, we can get up to almost twice that throughput per lane because we're able to get the vehicles closer together and we can damp out the disturbances. As we add a higher and higher volume of on-ramp traffic, though, because we also simulated an on-ramp, now that improvement starts going down because the entering traffic from the on-ramp creates some uh, conflict with the vehicles that are already in the main line. So again, this is as we add cooperative ACC. We did the same thing with the production autonomous ACC, and now we see the opposite effect. As we get more and more of the adaptive cruise control vehicles without cooperation, this gets worse. 
And that's because of the car following instability. So basically the disturbances get amplified, get traffic flow breakdown at lower traffic volumes instead of higher traffic volumes. Um, you can look at some animations. Let's see if I can find the cursor here. Um, maybe not. if the video would play properly. Let's see if the lower one will play. Uh, okay, all right. It's a little bit faint, but you can see the, uh, the motion of the vehicles along the highway. We have uh, a tra set of traffic conditions that actually produced a traffic jam when we had all manual driving, but in the lower plot here, we've got all cooperative ACC. The color codes on the dots indicate the speeds that they're traveling at. And um, in this case, you can see some slowdown. We have to make sure that the lane changing behaviors are realistic here, that they represent the kinds of things that drivers do when they're interacting in traffic. You see a little bit of slowdown right at the merge junction point, but the traffic continues to flow without any serious disturbances. Let's see if we can get the manual one to play now, since that one would play. Oops. I guess that one's not gonna uh, Anyway, if we had seen that one, we would have seen the total traffic flow break down because that was a volume of traffic that actually exceeded the ability of human drivers to be able to do the car follow. We estimate fuel consumption that we can get based on a model, uh, sort of a standard model called MOVES, that's developed by EPA. We take the speed profiles we get out of the traffic simulation, put it into the um, fuel consumption estimator. Uh, here we've got all manual driving on the upper left. That's just our human driver model. On the upper right is where we replace that with all cooperative ACC with a pretty high on-ramp traffic volume. And now we can see the color code indicates the rate of fuel consumption uh, locally. On the lower plot, you see what happens with just the production autonomous ACC on the left versus all cooperative ACC on the right. But in order to get these results, we had to cut the on-ramp volume down in half um, because the autonomous ACC was so bad that it couldn't actually operate at the higher volumes that we used in the upper part of the plot. Um, we calibrated our model for a freeway corridor in Sacramento where we had some very good traffic data as baseline. And uh, this is an example of that corridor at the upper left was the baseline conditions as they are today. Um, this is the morning from 4 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, as the horizontal scale, the vertical scale, just the different mileposts along the corridor and the color codes indicate speed. So we've got a couple of pretty significant bottlenecks. Uh, when we get to 20% cooperative ACC, uh, things are actually a little bit worse than they were in the manual case. You can see more of the darker blue. And that's because those cooperative ACC vehicles at very low penetration can't actually use their cooperative ACC capability. There aren't enough other vehicles near them that they can make use of the cooperation. So they can only operate in the autonomous ACC mode, which means that unstable form of vehicle following. Uh, but then once we get above that, you start seeing those bottlenecks just melting away as we get to higher and higher percentages of the cooperative vehicles in the traffic stream. So this is all really good. It would be nice if we could take advantage of that, but we have some challenges that we have to deal with before it becomes technologically possible to get the driver out of the control of the tire. And I'll talk first about the environmental perception challenges and then get into some of the safety challenges. So a system that's going to perceive the environment from that automated vehicle is going to have to, first of all, recognize all the relevant objects within the path of the vehicle. Other vehicles, uh, obstacles that fell off trucks, animals, pedestrians, cyclists, whatever. And not only perceive them or recognize them, but also predict their future motions. There's a really big difference between a pedestrian standing on the side of the road and a pedestrian stepping out into the path of the vehicle. 
if the vehicle puts on the brakes for every pedestrian standing on the side of the road, that's not going to be a very useful system. But some of the systems do that. Uh, so that prediction element is really important. It's very subtle what experienced drivers use to predict the future actions of other road users, and trying to incorporate that in software is no small challenge. And in order for a system to be acceptable, it's going to have to ma at least match the perception capabilities of experienced human drivers under all the conditions within the <coughs> operational design domain, that is, under the conditions in which it's intended to operate. In order to do that, there's no single sensor you're going to be able to depend on. There's no silver bullet that will solve all the problems. Uh, I think within the last year or two, there's been a growing recognition within the industry, within the companies working in this, that you're actually going to need all of the above. <coughs> Radar and LIDAR and high precision digital mapping and localization and video imaging and wireless communication. And whenever companies start putting out ideas saying, oh, they've got the perfect sensor, it's going to solve all the problems, uh, that's nonsense. Uh, these different sensor technologies have different strengths and weaknesses. And when you encounter a condition that's going to be bad for one of the technologies, it shouldn't be bad for the other technologies, so you have multiple sources of data. And also very relevant to the preceding panel, panel any one of these can be attacked with cyber attack, somebody can put stickers on the stop sign so it's not recognized as a stop sign. I also have a colleague who spoofed a, a LIDAR system as well by shining a laser pointer at it that was programmed to trick it into thinking there was an object in front. So any of those sensors could be hacked, but if you've got the data from the other sensor systems, you can cross-check and you can recognize which is the one that's producing anomalous data. So to have a useful and safe system, you're going to have to have these multiple sensors and that's going to cost money. There is a trade-off between safety and the functionality of systems. And in sensor signal processing, this comes down to false positive versus false negative in hazard detection. So in order to have a safe system, you've got to have virtually zero false positives. That means the system has to detect all of the real hazards that it's encountering. You don't want it to miss a real hazard. And Typically, because of limitations in sensor technology, what that means practically is the speed of the vehicle has to be limited, so the sensor has more chance to collect data and to analyze it and to figure out uh, is this a threat or not. And if there's any doubt, stop the vehicle. So that's the way you make sure you don't bump into anything. Well, that's not so good for the users of the vehicle if they have lots of false stops. So in order to have a, a functional system, a system that's going to serve uh, proper transportation services, you need very low false positives. That means you don't want the system to be responding to things that are totally harmless, because that becomes spurious emergency braking. And you want the system to be able to operate at a high enough speed that it can provide a useful transportation service. Um, it better be able to go faster than walking speed. So one of the ways of dealing with this is to simplify the operating environment. And there's some examples here on this slide of how the environment has been simplified for level four automation systems through cooperative infrastructure. So the upper left here are two personal rapid transit systems that are in operation, one in Mazdar in the United Arab Emirates, one in Heathrow Airport. They they're no driver on board those vehicles, they're level four automation, but they're on a protected environment. They, don't, they can't coexist with any other vehicles or pets or bikes or animals. Nobody else can get in there. Uh, the upper right was our demo in 97. Again, we had that HOV facility to ourselves. There were no other vehicles in there except for the properly equipped vehicles that could communicate with each other. The lower two pictures are from uh, a demonstration of the City Mobile 2 project in La Rochelle, France, uh, a couple of years ago. So these are low-speed automated shuttle vehicles that can only drive seven kilometers per hour based on the safety case they had to go through because they're interacting with pedestrians and with other vehicles. When they get to a place where they cross the path of other vehicles, they communicate with the traffic signal and the traffic signal flashes red and alerts the other drivers they need to stop so that the automated vehicle can cross the path. So each of these is a different form of restriction to help make it possible to be safe um, given limitations of the technology. So, 
sensor environment perception, one challenge, safety assurance, I would say is the even bigger challenge. And this is a big challenge because despite all the stuff you read about how terrible people are as drivers, the traffic safety statistics tell us otherwise. They tell us people are incredibly safe drivers already. When we look at the existing traffic safety statistics for the U.S., fatal crashes occur about once in three and a half million vehicle hours of operation. So if you took that as a single vehicle, it would be 390 years of continuous nonstop 24-7 drive. If you look at the injury crashes, it would still represent seven years of continuous 24-7 drive. Think about what that means. You have a very software intensive system that's operating <coughs> in an unstructured, unpredictable environment that has to go for years and years and years of continuous operation without having a serious fault. And put that in the context of your mobile phone or your tablet or your laptop and other modern consumer electronic devices. Could you imagine the ability of that system to operate for years and years and years on end without ever giving you the little hourglass symbol or the little wristwatch symbol or the spinning blue donut or whatever it gives you when it can't give you an answer. Because if that computer was driving your vehicle and it couldn't give you the answer, it crashed. Now, these numbers are really big, but they're only gonna get better over time because we've got growing use of collision warning and collision avoidance systems in vehicles. So human drivers, non-automated drivers, are gonna get better and better because they're gonna have more of these systems, SAE level zero and one especially, are going to make a major contribution to improving <coughs> safety. If you try to figure out how am I going to verify that my system has actually gotten to this level of safety, uh, the RAND Corporation published a paper a couple of years ago doing the statistical calculations to show that if you were going to produce a statistically significant uh, test to indicate that you were safer than human drivers, you were going to have to drive many times more than these numbers of hours or miles. That's totally unaffordable. You could never afford to do those experiments. So we got a problem of how would you even determine that you had a system that was at least as safe as humans are today. There's very little evidence from recent automated vehicle testing that can shed light on this, except we have one source, the California DMV testing rules that require annual reports on safety-related disengagements. And um, uh, again, um, Sam Schwartz referred to this this morning. Um, Waymo, the, the former Google group, is well ahead of the others. But this important caveat on their report, uh, they're showing about 5,600 miles between critical events for their 2017 test data, which is the last report that was published. But they're not reporting the actual disengagements. They're reporting the subset of the disengagements that would have produced a safety critical event after they played it through their simulation. So there were many more disengagements because the drivers are trained, the test drivers are trained to be very cautious to try to make sure no crashes happen. So we don't know what the actual disengagements were. And it's also interesting, that was only a 9% improvement over the previous year. So it's not as if we're still on the steep part of the curve uh, where things are getting better by large numbers. So we got 600 miles there. Well, if we look at the traffic safety statistics, we're about 2 million miles per injury crash, 100 million miles between fatal crashes, and the property damage crashes are kind of hard to document, but the insurance industry seems to be estimating about 300,000 miles for any kind of crash, even the property damage. So even the industry leader, the one with the best statistics right now, is still several orders of magnitude worse than what human drivers are doing. How would we actually go about certifying that this automation system had gotten to that level of safe enough? What's the process we're going to follow? Again, there was a suggestion this morning that there should be a NHTSA standard and then people would satisfy that standard. The problem is nobody knows how to develop that standard. What would the content of that standard be? What would the, re the technical requirement be that had to be tested? What's the combination of input conditions that would go into that test? And how do you take some combination of testing on closed tracks, testing on public roads, and simulations to produce convincing evidence that you had a safe system? How much would you do of each of those different processes? 
And if you're using a simulation, which by the way, Waymo does a lot of, how do you validate the simulation? And how does that get exposed to the public at large as a way of building public confidence so that other people can look at it and say, yeah, that's a fair representation of reality so we can trust those results. There is also a time and cost dimension to this. And uh, I was really interested to hear from both Boeing and Airbus that when they develop a new aircraft, fully half the cost of development for that new aircraft is software verification and validation. So the cost of doing their software verification and validation equals the cost of everything else. So developing the software in the first place is about 20%. 30% goes into all the electronic and mechanical components on the aircraft. And 50% is software VMD. The software on those aircraft it's probably one-tenth of the number of lines of code that we would be dealing with in a modern automobile. <coughs> so we're under a much, that's a much simpler system, and it's a system that's designed to operate with continuous supervision by two very highly trained human operators. It's not operating completely automatically. It's an autopilot mode, you know, they're doing automatic from takeoff to landing. There's still two pilots supervising them. So there are a number of technological breakthroughs we need to get through before we can get to the point of having a vehicle operating without human intervention on the highways. The biggest ones, the whole software safety design, verification, and validation methods, because the existing methods simply do not scale to a problem of this complexity. They all have really serious problems, especially when we get into learning systems. Again, that came up in the previous panel. We need some really robust threat assessment, sensing, and the signal processing so we can get to those zero false negatives and near zero false positives. Uh, the control systems have to have really robust fault identification and accommodation, and they have to be able to take their responses within about a tenth of a second, because if it takes much longer than that, you're out on the highway, you are running into somebody else. Uh, there's another whole set of areas about the ethical decision-making in robotics and the cybersecurity protection. And we heard a lot about the cybersecurity issues in the previous panel, so. I don't need to say anything more about that. This is way harder than commercial aircraft autopilot automation. The number of targets you have to deal with, the number of other road users, that is, the accuracy with which you need to know their locations and their motions relative to your motions, and the amount of time you have to respond when you've been interested in a critical situation. If you're flying an aircraft at 30,000 feet, maybe there are one or two other objects you might have to watch out for, and you know, otherwise you've got a clear environment. If something goes wrong at 30,000 feet, you've got tens of seconds to recover. If something goes wrong when you're driving on the freeway, you maybe have about a tenth of a second to recover. So in a lot of dimensions, this is much harder than aircraft autopilot automation. So given all of those challenges, how should we expect to see this roll out? Well, how much time and uh, what, what kind of trajectory might this follow? I, I hear people talking about getting to, you know, they've solved 99% of the problem and working on the last percent. Well, we need to think about that in the context of what it takes to climb Mount Everest. Um, this is like climbing Mount Everest, to get to the point where you've got a system that is as safe as a human driver. So I got to the point, I, I'm 90% of the way there. Well, I took the airplane from San Francisco to New Delhi. I'm 90% of the way to the top of Mount Everest. Um, <laughs> I took the connecting flight to Kathmandu. Okay, I'm 99% of the way to the top of Mount Everest. Then I took the next little uh, public number airplane to the closest to the base camp to Everest. 99.9% of the way there. I actually get up to the Everest base camp. 99.99% of the way there. Well, anybody can do that, but all the really hard stuff comes after that. Because to get to the top, and that is to get the automation system that handles, that's comparable to a human, it's got to get to 99 and about eight nines after the decimal point. That's hard. And that's the thing that nobody knows how to do yet. So when I take that all together, I try to estimate when might we see some of these things. So in this chart, we've got the different levels of automation on the horizontal scale, the different kinds of environments in which they would operate on the vertical scale. The green things exist already. The yellow things are, say, in the early 2020s, the light brown to the later 2020s, and the darker brown in the 2030s, 
but to get a level five where it goes everywhere, I said maybe 2075, maybe it's 2065, maybe it's 2100, maybe never. Um, again, I've talked with people in the vehicle industry, in fact, about a year ago, talking to somebody pretty high up in one of the most advanced of the automotive companies, and he said, yeah, we may never do level five. So let's not count on level five. That's to get to market introduction. Then how quickly do the vehicles roll out and actually start having an influence on the transportation system? Well, the fastest way of doing that is if you're required to put it on all the new vehicles. You've got a government mandate that forced it. So the example we have for that is seatbelts. Um, so we have a law requiring seatbelts on all the vehicles. Well, it took about six years after that became, came into effect, before we had 90% of the seats in the new vehicles equipped with seatbelts. It took 22 years until we had 90% of the seats of all of the vehicles on the road equipped with seatbelts. And this green plot that only got up to about 80% was the actual usage of the seatbelts. So just because you've got the technology on the vehicle doesn't mean that it's going to be used by the users. If we look at market growth of automotive options that we take for granted, this uh, time scale is a little hard to read here, but it's 35 years from left to right. This shows the growth of automatic transmissions from when uh, our power steering here. So this is when it's first available as an option to when it's standard equipment on all new vehicles. Air conditioning disc brakes, radial tires, electronic ignition. So these technologies take decades to go from being introduced as optional on high-end vehicles to being standard equipment on all vehicles. And then of course we've got the fleet turnover after that. How long does it take for those to become larger? I sometimes hear people in the industry complaining about regulations. Regulations are slowing down. We, we could do this if we didn't have restrictions on regulations. And I say that's nonsense. That is total nonsense. Um, California has the strictest regulations on automated vehicle testing in the United States. Uh, as of last month, we have 56 companies who've received their testing licenses, and those are licenses applied to 520 test vehicles and 1,845 test drivers. I would be surprised if the entire rest of the country has as many test vehicles and test drivers as we have in California. So having strictest regulations did not deter people from going out and actually getting the permission and doing the testing. Now developing regulations is tricky because you have to balance how you protect the public from the unsafe immature systems while you still want to encourage the safe innovations. And I, you know, I've talked with regulators about this in various venues. I really believe that when the AV developers can convincingly prove the safety of the systems, the regulators will eagerly approve them because the public demand is there to be able to get this. But proving that safety is the really hard part. So it's not the regulations that are the hard part, it's how does the manufacturer get to the point where they can prove to an independent uh, expert, yes, they've got a safe system. I know there have been predictions that we're going to have a nationwide automation revolution. Transportation system is going to see radical changes unlike anything it's seen for 100 years. Um, I think that's highly improbable. And I'll try to list some reasons here why I think it is improbable. First of all, the automation systems have to be designed to serve the requirements of the specific operational design domains um, based on their sensor capabilities and all the other constraints. But there are many different operational design domains, and each one has to be designed to serve the requirements of that operational design domain. You've got to serve a bunch of those kinds of operational design domains before you've met a significant chunk of the transportation needs of the people. Both the vehicle industry and the infra roadway infrastructure are very capital intensive industries. They have large sunk capital, so there are very good reasons why they don't change rapidly. Because it takes a long time to pay off those investments. There's also a tendency to take uh, trends that you might see from the urban sophisticates in urban cities like Brooklyn or San Francisco and extrapolate to the country as a whole, but I don't think that's a very valid extrapolation when we consider the differences in suburban, exurban, and rural parts of the country. People don't necessarily do the same things 
in most places as they do in the most sophisticated urban cores. Um, the cars are more than just a means of transportation. They have other forms of significance, and I'll talk about that on another slide. And I think there's some sort of social factors that are likely to constrain the growth of ride sharing as well. So uh, we also see alarmist uh, stories about how all the drivers are going to be put out of work and uh, driving jobs are going to go away. Again, I think that's also highly improbable uh, because the automation is only going to be capable of taking over the driving within narrowly constrained operational design domains for the foreseeable future. It's not like all of the truck trips are going to be capable of being automated. Some minor fraction of the truck trips will be capable of being automated. Not all of the taxi trips will be capable of being automated. Only some minor fraction of those will be capable of being automated. All the rest of them are still going to be done manually. Um, professional drivers who drive these vehicles have other responsibilities beyond simply tracking the lanes and following behind other vehicles safely. They need to serve the needs of the passengers. They need to provide security for the passengers or for the goods that they're carrying if it's freight. And they're involved in loading and unloading the vehicles if it's freight movement. So again, there are all of these other responsibilities that drivers have that are not being automated. And of course, anybody involved with the trucking industry knows there's a severe shortage of professional drivers. And that shortage is not getting any better. So the fact that there are more truck driving job opportunities than there are truck drivers. I was in a meeting last week where one of the major truck manufacturers was saying uh, he had a customer who told him he could order another 100 trucks if he could find the drivers to drive them. But he can't find the drivers, so he's not ordering the additional trucks. I, I hear these predictions at the end of car ownership. Everything's going to be shared rides. And again, I think this is highly improbable. Um, personal cars are more than just transportation. And again, especially when you get outside the urban cores. That's a lot, a lot think of what happens in midtown Manhattan or Brooklyn or downtown San Francisco. But the country as a whole, they're sources of status and self-image for a lot of people. Uh, they're a very practical mobile storage locker for people's personal needs. And if you're doing purchases on a shopping trip, that's where you put your stuff. Um, for many people, it's a refuge from the rest of the world. You've got privacy and some isolation from outside stresses. And it's a space you control yourself. You lose all of that if you're sharing that. If it's not even your vehicle, it's somebody else's vehicle, or you're sharing it with other people. Um, the whole notion of self-sufficiency for people's essential mobility can also be an important aspect of people's own personal dignity. They don't have to depend on some outside agent for getting around. And for many people, people who are salespeople, to people in construction and maintenance, and farming, the tools of their trade are heavy, bulky stuff that they need to carry with them. They kind of have that in their personal vehicle. That's not going to go away. It's going to be a personal owned vehicle. Um, again, the sharing. Uh, I think this is likely to be a specialized urban niche application, not something that's going to be taking over transportation nationwide. People want to have their own vehicles, their own privacy. Um, we also have the limitations of the technology. Uh, you have to get to a certain density of trips in order for the notion of sharing to even be economically viable. And I think there's some real reluctance people are going to have to sharing a small vehicle with no driver, no authority figure there for security, with a very small number of total strangers. Think of personal security concerns. Is that person somebody I'm comfortable sharing this intimate space with? Different preferences in personal hygiene or choices of music. Uh, you want to have some private communication, phone call. Well, now you've got a private call, you're going to have, well, there's somebody else sharing this very intimate space. I, I don't think so. Um, I, I, from Based on the presentation Lyft gave last summer, I'm inclined to think that they've now started to recognize this. And this is not going to take over the whole world. Well, if you read all the stuff in the media, you wouldn't have heard any of these things. You would have heard, ah, oh, it's all going to happen tomorrow. And everything's rosy. And that's because the public is really eager to be able to gain the benefits of the automation. And the media people want to satisfy that public hunger because the sexier the story, the more clicks they're going to get on the story. If they write a story about here are the advantages, here are the disadvantages, here's why it's going to take a long time, that's not a very exciting story. But they talk about here's the revolution that's coming tomorrow, that's a much more exciting story. It's going to get a lot more clicks. On the industry side, uh, we have the Silicon Valley uh, phenomenon called FOMO. If 
fear of missing out on the next big thing. And this has been labeled as the next big thing in many cases, so everybody's got to get on board. And then all those companies want to make sure they have the image of being the technology leader. So as soon as one company exaggerates their claims, well, all the competitors have to exaggerate as well so that it doesn't look like they're falling behind. And typically, journalists haven't been trained to ask the probing questions that need to be asked in order to separate the fluff from the reality. Um, companies are also actively manipulating the media reports. And at least when I know, when I talk to the engineers who are actually doing the real work within the companies and compare what they say with what their corporate CEOs and marketing people say, it's total, dis total disconnect. Uh, what they're actually doing in developing systems in the companies doesn't match what you hear in the media. So um, the, these are a lot of negative things about why this isn't going to happen immediately, but we want to move forward. I mean, this is something I've worked on it for 45 years. I'd sure like to see some of this become a reality uh, during my lifetime. So what should we be doing? And I would say first, we should be focusing on implementing the systems that are technically feasible right now, both to gain more on-road experience, to be able to enhance their performance, and to start gaining public confidence that these systems work well and that they can be trusted. <coughs> level one and two driving automation systems and getting the communications in place so that we have the enablers for the vehicle to vehicle and the vehicle to infrastructure cooperation. Then um, people in the industry should be developing the more highly automated systems, but they're going to have to start within very well constrained operational design domains in order to be able to ensure the safety. Those initial operational design domains may not be economically viable. This is probably going to require some pretty heavy investments and subsidies. And then gradually, those operational design domain restrictions can be relaxed as the technology improves so that it's capable of handling more of the real world traffic environment. And finally, this is more on the research side, we really need a lot of work on those fundamental breakthroughs that are going to be needed to enable high automation under less constrained condition. And that's where there are opportunities for all the young researchers and students working in this field. Um, I, I tell them the students showing up in Berkeley, if they're excited about this field, they'll be able to spend their entire career working on solving the problems that need to be solved. And when they're ready to retire, there'll still be more problems for the next generation to work on. So this isn't something that's going to um, wind up with all the problems solved within the next few years or even the next few decades. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, I, guess we, I guess we've got some time for a, a few questions, if people got questions. Uh, yeah, Jerry. Yeah, uh, Steve, can you go back to that matrix you presented with the time frame on it? Okay. Oops, went the wrong way. first introductions of those systems, yeah. So um, like the closed campus and pedestrian zone things um, are examples that a number of companies are working on and uh, I can see those becoming feasible. They'd be operating at very limited speeds, um, probably on fixed routes within, uh, let's say, those closed campus or pedestrian zones and they'd probably be largely segregated from higher speed traffic and to the extent to which they'd be segregated from the pets and cyclists, I'm not even quite sure yet. And that's one of those things to be determined. But, but yeah, those things I could see happening uh, within that time frame. But when we get to the higher levels of automation under the less constrained environments, that's where it gets a lot harder. Uh, yeah? Uh, what are, do you know what the uh, individual perceptions are about driving in uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, how do they feel about the risk, whatever? Well, the, the surveys on that are all over the map. Uh, so you wind up with, uh, and, they, and each one has a wide range of opinions. So some people are really enthusiastic and some people are really negative. And then it differs from one survey to another how those get divided up. 
And I think a lot of that is related to how the surveys are worded and how clear an impression do the survey, uh, the people involved in the survey, <coughs> what the system would do. I, I think one of the pressing needs is to get some more realistic documentation, probably some graphics and maybe some animations as well that could be used to expose people to a more realistic sense of what's the experience likely to be of taking a trip on one of these automated vehicles and then ask them the questions about what they like or dislike. But um, I, I think the, um, the levels of um, information they get about the system vary widely and that's one of the reasons a lot of the survey results vary so widely. Uh, of course, surveys are still only going to be stated preference rather than revealed preference. What's going to be much more interesting is how do we get to the point of being able to do some revealed preference experiments where people could actually have a real experience of using the vehicle and then give some reactions. For example, when we did that demo in 97, it was about a, an eight, nine minute long ride uh, that everybody got on the test vehicles. And at the end, we surveyed them on a, a whole bunch of questions about their opinions. And typically, the first minute or two, they were sort of on edge, not very comfortable with the idea. But once they sensed the performance of the system, they got very comfortable with it. And the survey results were off the scale on the positive side uh, for just about everybody who took the demo rides. So a lot depends on how people get to experience this. So I think I read a uh, few months ago the demo level four. Oh no no, they're doing level four. They don't. They want to, they're, they're skipping level three. Level three because the reaction time is because and the level three is controversial because is it possible to get the driver re-engaged after they've not been involved in the driving at all? But no, Waymo so is what's, doing what's level. Your, what's your opinion? Um, I think it's still an open question because there's a lot of research going on on that right now. And there's actually a divide within the vehicle industry between companies that want to do level three and companies that really don't think level three can be done safely. Uh, the level three systems that are being developed are actually very, very narrow in their uh, application. So what they are are systems that could be used only on freeways and only in traffic jam conditions. So let's say you're in dense traffic, stop and go traffic, and you as the driver could tune out and go and surf the web or do something else. But when the conditions change and the system gets into a situation that's outside its ODD, it's going to then give a message to the driver saying, you're going to need to start driving because we can't handle it anymore. So for example, if the traffic jam clears and speed goes above 30, the system will not go above 30. It's going to go above 30, the driver has to get re-engaged, and then it becomes a level two system and requires continuous driver involvement. So it's not going to require a quick response? Well, that's actually the, the, the controversy right now about how quick does that response need to be. And there are different people arguing on different sides of the map about that, about whether it's going to have to be a quick response or whether it could be um, a longer term response. So again, that's an open controversy. <coughs> Yes, so Alan's hand back there. Uh, Steve, shouldn't we also get rid of level five? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, of course we should. I mean, uh, you know, level five has this fully business in it. And and fully, uh, nothing's, nothing's fully. No, nothing's probability zero, nothing's probability one. Uh, these things are never going to drive down the riverbed uh, that, uh, that the uh, Jeep commercial shows that we could drive our Jeep down the riverbed. They're not going to be able to, I mean, really, do we want to solve this, the, the, uh, the fog and the uh, six-foot snowdrift problem? I don't think so. What, I mean, what, that's what, like ridiculous. No, no, Alan, that's not what level five says. Level five excludes the whiteout conditions, the flooded conditions, the snowdrifts. It says conditions under which humans are capable of driving, not the conditions under which they're not capable of driving. But in your and operational design areas, and the, the, you, you can define operational design areas where uh, maybe even the Waymo system today can do it just as well as we can, or at least they're, they're, as long as it's Chandler, Arizona, with no, nothing but white people or something, it can do it. Well, well, well no, Alan, it, it can't do anything close to what normal human drivers can do. It's much In more Chandler, than, I think so. Well, you know, I, Alan, I live a few blocks from Waymo. I share my roads with their vehicles all the time. 
they drive. Yeah, but you don't right. live in Chandler. I mean, Chandler is like is like. I mean, it's it's, it's the it's, easy operate. I mean, it's, it's it's the same system. It's the same system, and they drive like eighty year old grandmas. <laughs> they are very very timid drivers. You and mean you violate fact, rules of the road, Steve? I mean, I, I'm surprised. They, they are very timid, and in fact, one of the reasons they get into crashes is because their behavior violates the expectations of the other drivers. Uh, that's that's what, uh, come on, that's not true. Nobody's proven that. A lot of people have said it. Look, when I drive behind people, and all the people driving around me are goofy drivers, too. I mean, come on, Steve. Yeah. Uh, Alan, sorry, uh, we're going to have to disagree on I, I, we, Okay, good, uh, we disagree. Very, very thoroughly. <laughs> And uh, I can cite you lots of examples of those vehicles doing really stupid things uh, that no normal driver would do. And 80% and and, and, of the drivers in Princeton do the same stupid things. But go ahead, whatever, never mind. Come, come on to California and start driving in our neighborhood. Oh, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, <laughs> Love yeah. Steve. Do you believe uh, that an autonomous vehicle should be connected vehicle or the need of real time map information, the always spatial characteristics. I, I, I don't think the map information is the critical thing in terms of the connectivity, because the map is kind of a static object. What you need the, the connectivity for is all of the rapidly changing things. It's the motions of all of the other mobile entities in your environment. That's what you need the connectivity How about the, the and, and, the, and, and the traffic control signal. devices, the stop signs, the no turns and the, it, or marking change that it happens at a certain point and the the I mean uh, the lidar system may not uh, be able to recognize everything unless he has that information uh, uh, in the prior uh, time of this information and that's what actually the autonomous uh, manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you can handle a lot of that through your software updates, not necessarily real-time communication. The real-time communication you need for things that are changing rapidly, like you do need it for traffic signal phase timing, and you would need it for the motions of all of the other moving objects around you, but I, I wouldn't worry so much about the static road environment uh, for the, the communication. Uh, I think you can handle that with an onboard database. So you don't see any benefit of uh, having both the autonomous vehicle being connected even if you have to update the firmware once uh, a day or whatever with all the, the regulation, roadway regulation. I think the, the amount of things would have to be updated every day is probably really small really small compared to the total information that would be in the database that's characterizing the city. Um, but when you have operation constant like uh, over here in New York City, we have 100,000 intersections and 13,000 signalized intersections. Right. So we have crews constantly making changes. Right, but it's a question of how many of those changes are significant enough that they need to be communicated to the vehicle versus the things that the vehicle sensors can easily perceive. Um, so you know, remember, it's a combination of the communication and the sensing. So you, st you still have to have your full suite of sensors. So uh, the large majority of that stuff that the sensors are going to be able to detect. Is the current technology is, uh, sufficient enough to have uh, the perfect sensors? There's never, the per the, there's, the actual there's, there's never a perfect sensor. So, and that's one of the reasons you need multiple complementary sensors so that the things that the one sensor doesn't perceive so well can be perceived by the other sensors too. So, again, none of this is going to be perfect. This is all going to be imperfect. Um, as I often mention when I give these talks, we're replacing human driving errors with human design and coding errors. So the human errors have not disappeared. It's a different kind of human error. And hopefully those are going to be less serious than the human driving errors. So that we, in the average, we hope we would have a safer system. I think Shreepark wants to get us to the break. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, let's give him a round of applause.